tonight is Dr. Lynn Kinter, and I am delighted that she is here to give this presentation on orchids. Uh, she has been the lead botanist at the Idaho Department of Fish and Game since 2007. She has more than 30 years of experience in plant research and resource management, including work with the BLM, the Forest Service, and Wyoming Game and Fish Department. She has also taught botany and biology classes at Boise State University. She has a BS, MS, and PhD degrees from the University of Idaho, the University of Wyoming, and Washington State University, respectively. She is a longtime member of the Idaho Native Plant Society and lives in Boise. So um, uh, welcome, Lynn, and I have shared the screen with you. Um, so you should be good to go there. You'll just need to unmute yourself. And um, okay. maybe we can give Lynn a, a virtual uh, round of applause as she uh, steps to the stage. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Well, I appreciate it, Kristen. It's great to be here, to be back with, I appreciate it. Um, great to be back with those of you from the Wood River chapter again and Idaho Native Plant Society around the state, as well as some others who are joining us. So it's fun we can all get together like this. I appreciate this chance to talk with you about some of Idaho's most amazing native plants. Um, how many of you have seen orchids in the wilds of Idaho? If you could either, you can either raise your hand like this or put up a, Abigail, where did you see them? Um, I found four different species on Scout Mountain. Wow, that's great. Diane, so how about you? Oh, sorry, what? Um, just in case you don't know, that's near Pocatello. I know they were talking about it before, but not all of you may know where that is. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So up, up in a mountain near Pocatello. How about you, Diane? Uh, Moscow Mountain. Another mountain. Okay. Yep. Well, let's see who else has their thumb or hand up. I have to scroll between screens, so it's a little tough. Well, oh, uh, okay, Jerry. Uh, we actually have, we live a little bit east of Troy, Idaho, uh, and we have three species on our place and nearby there's probably another three or four species. So, uh, you know, we're at about 2,600 feet elevation. They're every place if you know where to look. So, Coralariza, <laughs> Calypso, uh, they're, they're not that hard to find if you know what you're looking for. Great, great, glad to hear that. <laughs> Anybody else who has a, what they wanna add? How about outside of, I? oh, John, you've got your hand up. How about you, John Shelley? Yeah, in the early days, uh, which is probably 20 plus years ago, horse, 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 horse service, uh, Utes Ladies Trust was, uh, was uh, nominated for, I think, threatened or endangered one or the other. Anyway, yes. so let us, Plant-oriented people know what it looked like. We did a few field trips upriver from Ryrie and found, uh, didn't find. We were taken to some sites that were known. So uh, Utes Ladies Tresses is, is one that's pretty rare. Absolutely, yes, it's threatened and it's uh, known on the snake. We'll see some pictures of it in the slide program. Okay, well, it's fun to see so many hands raised and kind of learn about some of these places. So along the Snake River, the South Fork of the Snake that John mentioned, and on a couple of mountains that Abigail and Diane mentioned, that's great. Um, I think when most of us think of orchids, we tend to think of something like this. This is a little uh, domestic orchid that I have here at my my house. Oh, I'm trying to hold up hold it up so you can see it. Can you see that? Not too, not too in focus, is it? Today, I don't know what. Let me put my hand behind it instead. Or maybe you can see. This is an insidium. It's a type of orchid that it, uh, kind of has a whole bunch of little flowers and flutters in the breeze, kind of like little little bees. And we'll see um, a little bit more about these types of orchids later. But this one is a domestic orchid that is from the tropics. Most of our most of the ones people grow as house plants are from the tropics and they tend to grow up in trees uh, or on cliff faces and they tend to be um, 
green and growing year round. Unlike the native Idaho orchids, which are obviously found, you know, in the woods, they go, they senesce in the winter. So it's a very different type of plant. But I'm going to talk first about overall orchids and then go into some of the specifics of the Idaho orchids. I think we can go to our PowerPoint now. If um, I'll put that up and I'll, I'll need to share this, share my screen. Looks like I can do that. You should be able to. Okay. Grab the PowerPoint here. There it is. Hopefully you all can see that. Is that looking okay? Okay, good. Um, these are some of the orchids that we'll see, these and, and uh, many others here shortly. I want to start by acknowledging Kristen Fletcher from the Native Plant Society, who has led so many wonderful field trips and other educational programs around the Wood River Valley through the years. It's really a, a treasure for your community there. She is, <laughs> she and her, her programs. Then in the talk, I want to, um, you'll see many maps, maps of each species. And those are from the John Cartes' um, Biota of North America program. And then the photo acknowledgements are here listed, um, particularly a whole bunch of wonderful ones from Robert Carr at Eastern Washington University and uh, a few from James Reiser Native Plant Society and from Jim Fowler, who's a professional photographer in South Carolina. And you might recognize Jim um, if you saw the orchid stamps, the wild orchid stamps that came out about a year ago. Those are native species to um, across North America. The topics we're gonna cover today are the unique traits of orchids, why they are, what makes an orchid an orchid essentially, then we'll go through all the Idaho orchids and we'll talk about some other plants that look like orchids. So when you're in the field, you can hopefully recognize them. I'll give you some tips for finding orchids. And then we'll talk a little bit about historic orchid hunting in the orchid mania days, orchid delirium days. And then depending on how our time goes, we'll talk some about the orchid research that the Idaho uh, Fish and Game, my colleagues at Fish and Game and I have done. We'll see, we have about an hour. As Kristen said, we wanna end by eight and have some time for general questions at the end. But I've got a lot of material. So it, as we go along, if there are things you don't understand or wanna ask specific questions about, you can put those in the chat and then we'll do more general type questions at the end. So we'll start with the unique traits of the orchid family. They're found on every continent except Antarctica. And there are around 30,000 species, uh, more than any other plant family, although some argue that the aster family has more. They com uh, comprise about 10% of the world's plant species and about 1% of the plants in Idaho. Because we have 28 species, there are about 2,800 vascular plants in Idaho. So. One really unique thing you'll notice about an orchid flower is that it has one odd shaped petal. And this is a term to labellum or lip. You can see it um, here. Hopefully you can see my cursor there pointing. Can you see my cursor? Great, thank you, Kristen. Pointing to the labellum. It's a, sometimes it's, in this case, it's a landing platform, but it might also be a tube, a hood, a boot, or some other strange shape that's not like the rest of the, the petals. And then, so you can see here five, uh, you can see the labellum and two other petals and then three sepals. And when they all look similar like this, they're often called tepals, or just tepals. So you'll see five similar looking tepals and then an odd shaped labellum. And you can see the same thing in the plants on the right, the, just the labellum isn't as pronounced in the orchid on the right. Another unusual thing about orchid flowers is that the male and female parts are fused into a column, what's termed a column. So the male part uh, in this case is on the end and the female part behind it. And in comparison, this is um, what we might think of as a more typical flower if there is such a thing, but um, in which the male and female parts are separate. And so you can see the female part or the stigma here and then the male anthers around it completely separate from the female part. Also to compare, give you an idea of how the orchid family compares, um, the flowers compared to some other families. This is a 
this is Woods Rose or Rose Woodsy, I, a member of the Rose family. You can see five petals that are essentially the same. You know, they very, very similarly shaped anyway. And then the anthers or the male parts here, and then the female part or stigma in the middle. So um, pretty different from your typical orchid flowers. Here's a couple other examples. The lily family looks a little bit more like orchids in that they have six petals and the petals look alike. So we could say six, well, they really have technically three petals, three sepals, or we might say six tepals um, that look alike, but you still see the female part here in the middle separate and then the anthers, the male, uh, male pollen bearing parts around the outside of the stigma and no labellum, no, no odd shaped sixth petal, if you wanna think of it that way. Now, many flowers are not regular, like those I just showed you. Many, uh, many plants, plant families have an odd shaped flower. For example, the pea and bean family, it'll have one giant um, petal here, which is a banner. I, I like to think of it as a banner advertising to the insects, eat here. You know, come look for look for nectar here. And uh, in this case, so we've got one odd shaped flower, but you'll see two other or one odd shaped petal, but two other petals are these little wings on the side, and then there's a keel or boat shaped um, petal in the middle. And so it's really quite different from the orchids. But this is how we tell an orchid member member of the orchid family from other families. So that's what you can look for if you're in the wild and you, you want to know if, you've, if you're looking at an orchid or if you're just looking at pea and bean family members or something else, some other odd shaped uh, member. Another unusual thing about orchid flowers is that their pollen are packed in pollinia. These are little packets of pollen. Most plants send their pollen out in grains, in individual grains, not in packets like this. And so on the upper right, you can see two packets of, of pollen in there. Here, here are the pollinia stuck to, some, stuck to an insect. Uh, the pollinia are actually sticky on the end. And so the insect will bump into it, it'll stick onto the insect and then it'll carry it to another flower. Can you think of any other plants that have pollinia? You can raise your hand. I'm not sure if I can see everybody, so I don't know how to. Oh, I can scroll through, but I can only see. Cynthia, do you want to unmute and tell us? Asclepias? Yes, great, thank you. Asclepias or milkweeds. So here's a, a bee that I took on a local milkweed. This is um, Asclepias cryptosurus, hidden. hidden well, Davis's milkweed, Asclepias cryptosurus um, variety divisii, it is. And you can see on the bee's leg, hopefully you can see a little gold saddlebag there. That's, a, that's the pollinia of a milkweed. So it's shaped a little bit different. It's a different strategy than the, the orchid flowers. In the milkweed, the, the insect's leg goes down in this hole and when it pops out, it, it'll have pollinia stuck to its leg. There's another, I thought I was going to have to give you hints. I didn't know anybody was going to guess it right away. So I put in another milkweed and their famous monarch butterflies uh, as a hint for you, but you got it. Well, orchids are exquisite pollinator attractors. They have just a, an incredible array, incredible diversity of um, ways to attract pollinators. And here's a uh, plant from South America, an orchid from South America that attracts hummingbirds. Long, narrow, tube-shaped flower that the hummingbird can put its fill in. And it has nectar at the bottom of the tube. Nectar rewards are very common in the orchid family, but, but actually only about two-thirds of the orchids do that. About one-third don't have nectar. So This is a really interesting nectar-bearing orchid from Madagascar. Um, it was sent to Charles Darwin in 1862 as he was writing a book on orchids. And um, you can see here that the title page of the book, the various contrivances by which orchids are fertilized by insects. 
He had published Origin of Species in 1859, and then this was his next book after that. And he was in, really intrigued by this orchid because it has a long spur off the back of the flower, and at the bottom of the spur is nectar. So no one at that time really knew how to get, uh, no one, it wasn't accepted at the time that necessarily a flower and its pollinator or an insect eating nectar would have, would have evolved with a flower. This was, you know, long before that concept. And so his, um, his uh, hypothesis that orchid, that this particular orchid was fertilized by an insect with a very long tongue or proboscis was not accepted at all. It was extremely controversial. The, the spur is about a foot and a half long. That's where this, this scientific name comes from, the specific epithet, sesqua, one and a half, and then foot or feet there. So that a foot and a half long spur would have an insect with a tongue that was a foot and a half long, that wasn't supported. Very few people um, were in his camp, but Alfred Russell Wallace was a notable exception to the mainstream. And he actually had this, um, this illustration in one of his books of what he thought the moth would look like. It was published in 1867. And during that time, <clears throat> there was a tremendous controversy around this. Let's see, the journal Nature, which is a big leader in the field, put out two calls asking for anybody who knew of this moth in 1887 and again in 1907. So decades apart, has anyone seen anything like this? And 40, 40 years later, after Darwin first published it, the Morgan Sphinx moth was discovered. It was in 1903, nature hadn't, the word didn't get out for a while till nature, that's why they had the other call in 1907, but you can see here a foot long proboscis. So the, the um, varietal name Predicta is, uh, refers to the fact that Darwin and some others had predicted the existence of this moth long before it was found. Another way that orchids attract insect pollinators is through scent. And the, here's one, the pyramid orchid from Eurasia that has a, a foxy scent. It attracts moths. Some of them will put out their scent at night if they're attracting moths or during the day if they attract butterflies. And in the uh, photograph or the illustration on the right is from Darwin's book showing an acontia, <clears throat> the proboscis of an acontia with seven pairs of pollinia attached to the proboscis, something that he observed. Another really clever way that orchids, uh, they don't necessarily attract, but, but uh, get insects to carry out their fertilization for them, the process of or pollination for them, is by trapping insects and leaving only one way that the insect can get out. So this is a yellow lady slipper, which is found in Idaho. And Darwin hypothesized that the insect put its proboscis down in the opening you can see there. And it, it worked for picking up the pollen, but it didn't work for depositing the pollen on the next flower. So um, Asa Gray, who was a contemporary of his in, back in North America, suggested that he actually put the, the bee, he knew there were bees pollinating, that they put the bee into the trap. And so he did that and the bee had only one way to crawl out up the back of the of this slipper that you can see here and the bee had to, in, in that process of crawling out of the trap, it was able to deposit the pollinia. So he figured it out. Asa Gray essentially figured it out. Kind of funny thing, Darwin also put flies in the trap, but he said they were too dumb to find their way out. Some orchids mimic flowers that have nectar. So they don't actually produce nectar themselves, but they look like and grow near a plant that has nectar. So what does this one look like to you? Somebody want to raise their hand and or just unmute and say it. Say what you think. Any gardeners in the group? Okay, what about pansy? 
It does look like a pansy. Mm -hmm. yep. Oh, okay. I, like I, 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 that, that's the end of my uh, gardening ability. <laughs> okay. How about vegetable gardening? <laughs> I was, uh, to me, it looks a lot like a pea flower. And this grows with peas. So if next time you see a sweet pea or a pea in the garden, remember the donkey flower from Australia and the, the fact that it doesn't produce nectar, the pea flower does, and it tricks insects into coming to it, its flowers in search of nectar only. So. Well, here's one for you. You can probably guess what pollinates this one. It's, it's the, called the pile of meat orchid. I'm not, I'm not making this up. <laughs> Uh, it really looks and smells like a rotting pile of meat. So any guesses on what pollinates that? Ants. Ah, ants are a good guess. I hadn't thought of that actually. Flies. Close. Flies, yes. <laughs> the, the white or yellow stringy things on it are believed to resemble maggots. That's part of the orchid, but they think it's attracting flies to think it's a maggot, ma covered with maggots. So. <laughs> and here we make it to the Oncidium. I mentioned the little, um, the little orchid, the little domestic orchid that I showed you, the Oncidium. This is one type, but there are many types in this, many members of this genus, and they flutter in the wind like a bee. This particular one from Panama um, mimics the centrist bee and male centrist bees are very territorial. And so they'll headbutt the orchid thinking they're fighting a, a male bee. And then in the process, they'll pick up the polenia and carry it to another flower, which they then headbutt. Uh. <laughs> so. Some mimic insects as mates, for example, the bee orchid from Europe. It looks and smells like a female longhorn bee. And so the male comes along and tries to mate with the flower or what he thinks is a bee. And in the process, he picks up plenty of, goes to the next one and deposits it. This is along the same lines here. This is called the warty hammer orchid. Looks like a little warty hammer there. But it's actually mimicking, let's see if I can um, draw in the blank on the name of the bee, the wasp. This is a wasp. Um, oh, um, it's a thinid wasp. So the part on the left of the photo here looks like a, a female thinid wasp and it smells like her as well. So the male, and they're flightless. The males typically fly along, pick up the female, and then they go mate. Um, in this case, when the male tries to pick up the female, there's a spring right in the middle here that makes this hammer over and, and hammer the male into the column into the, to pick up polynia. Poor guy. And here's an even worse one. It's a flying deck orchid from Australia. Um, the, the, this part, the labellum looks like um, see which another another female wasp, another species, I guess, which springs downward and traps the male against the column. Here's what it looks like once the trap is sprung. Flying duck orchids. So those are just some examples of the crazy ways that orchids attract pollinators. Orchids also have the tiniest seeds of any plant. There's several genera with the tiniest seeds. Um, you can see on the in the lower left here compared to mustard seeds, which are small, really small, but not nearly as small as orchids. Wolfia in the lowest left is those are, that's the smallest plant or smallest flower and, uh, known, and their seeds are still much larger than orchid seeds. Orchid seeds have no nutrient reserves, so they have to find a fungal symbiont and right away so that they can start getting food and grow. Some orchids depend on fungi their whole lives, others only in these initial stages. 
Lynn, could I uh, just interrupt you briefly? Um, sure. We had one comment from someone who said that they were a fourth generation Idahoan and they were embarrassed to say that they didn't know until they read the announcement that there were native orchids in Idaho, which I thought was really lovely. That's um, great. And then uh, we do have a question that um, from someone, do the trips reset after they spring? Oh, that is a great question. I don't know, but I would expect not because, well, actually I would think I would expect they would because the male has to, he would pick up some of the, the pollen, the pollinia, but then potentially he could revisit that flower to fertilize it with pollen from another plant. So I don't know, that's a great question. Well, the, the comment about being fourth generation and not knowing that orchids exist in the wild is, is probably totally typical for Idaho. Um, it's just, uh, um, well, we'll go into that in a second, but yeah, that's so typical, I think. As I mentioned, orchid seeds are the tiniest in the world. They're often just dust-like. Here's an example. Compared to a penny, you can see how small they are, maybe a million in a given orchid capsule. Can you think of um, some orchids that we eat, a type of orchid that we eat? Can anybody think of that? You just have Vanilla. to unmute yourself or put it in the chat, one of the two. Vanilla. Yes, vanilla, great. And I'll, I've got some here, I don't know, I might be too small, I can um, to show them, but uh, there aren't very many orchids we eat. For example, compared to the bean and pea family, where we eat a lot of the members of that family, we don't eat very many of the orchid family. Here's a, here it is. <clears throat> I'm gonna have to put, here's some vanilla, a vanilla orchid pod. This is actually the seed pod of an orchid. There you go. So, um, but, but most of them we don't eat. Anybody know of any others? Anybody been to Turkey and eaten ice cream? <laughs> you very well may have, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot I had this, but you very well may have eaten orchid ice cream in Turkey. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Here's uh, what the vanilla looks like. It's used in addition to cooking and baking, which we all know, it's also used in perfume making. Vanilla is native to Mexico and other, and to from Mexico down to Northeastern South America and the Caribbean. And here's the salop. It's actually made from the starchy roots of a few orchid species. Sometimes it's uh, made into a hot drink as well. The ice cream's on the right, the hot drink is on the left. Now we come to the Idaho We orchids. have a, a quick note from Abigail Stelser saying that the okay. hammer orchid does reset itself. So apparently she's done some research on that. And Great, thank you, thanks, Abigail. Abigail. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> that's good to know. <laughs> We have 28 species of orchids in Idaho, and this is more even than Hawaii. You might be surprised to know that Hawaii has only three native orchid species. There's lots of orchids grown there, but only three are actually native. Most are domestic. Seven of our 28 are rare, and a few still need to be assessed for the um, rare plant list, thanks to Derek Antonelli and some others in the Idaho Rare Plant Working Group or the Idaho Native Plant Society. They're working on assessing those. There are actually no orchids that are endemic to Idaho. That, that means none that are just limited to Idaho. And so far we have no invasive orchids in Idaho, but I will talk at the end about one that's near the border. Typical habitats are the things like you mentioned, deep woods, mountain forests, um, around springs or along river, rivers and river floodplains and fens. A fen is uh, like a bog, but it's, either neutral pH or, or alkaline, and they're typically groundwater fed. They high, have a lot of dissolved minerals. 
A bog in comparison would be acidic and be low in dissolved minerals and fed by rainwater. So um, most of everything I've seen in Idaho called a bog is actually a fen, but that's a great place to look for orchids. If you're ever around anything that seems kind of marshy or Lynn, you just froze. Um, if you don't unfreeze, you might need to go out and come back in. All are terrestrial. By that, I mean they don't grow in um, they don't grow in trees. On epiphyte, they're not epiphytes or lithophytes like many of the tropical orchids. And. Here's a, you can see the, a purple epiphytic organ right, orchid right in the middle of this photo. Lithophytes are those that grow on stones or on cliffs, rock cliffs. For example, this orchid shown here. So all of ours grow in soil, none up in the trees. I'm going to go through all of our Idaho orchids. These are the groups or genera that we have in the state. Um, Clipso, which uh, Jerry mentioned earlier, the Clipso orchid. And um, well, we'll just go one by one through each of these groups. My favorite, we're going to start with my favorite, which is the very first one I ever saw. I was um, living in Moscow at the time as an undergrad and going on plant collections with Doug Henderson. And we saw it somewhere around Elk, over towards uh, Elk Creek Falls. He, uh, he had us do a plant collection for that class, but he said, anyone who collects an orchid will get an F. So we had to know our orchids. <laughs> this is a tiny pink slipper. It's only about an inch tall. And uh, it does have, it smells like vanilla, but there's no nectar reward there. It's fertilized almost entirely by queen bumblebees. The, it, it blooms, if you're looking for it, you can find it uh, mid-April to late June in the mountains. Forest floor is a good place to find it. You can see uh, in these, I'm going to have a series of maps or a map after each species that I present. And the dark green just means it's found somewhere in the state, but not, not in that county. The light green are the counties where it's documented in the Bayet of North America project. For the most part, he relies on herbarium specimens, although he may not have all the latest ones. And then if it's yellow, that means it's rare in that state. So that's why some of these are yellow. But the Calypso orchid isn't rare, but it's not terribly common. It's just not on the rare list for us here in Idaho. The second really unique one that reminds me somewhat, it, it also on the, on the uh, slipper theme, I guess, or the, is the yellow lady slippers. This is a large yellow slipper. It's, oh, as big as a golf ball, I would say. Um, it's pollinated by many bee species. This is the one that Darwin put the bee down in there and figured out, figured, uh, watched it crawl out of the trap. It is on our rare plant list. Blooms in June, typically in June. And you can see the counties here where it's been recorded in Idaho, north, basically Northern Idaho. But oh, one looks like your county there, <laughs> your, your neighborhood. You'll see for some of these that are rare, I give the G rank and the S rank. And it's a scale of one to five for rarity. So five is the most common, S is the most rare. I mean, one is the most rare. And G stands for global. That'd be across its whole known range. S is just in the state of Idaho. So yellow lady slipper is fairly common in some parts of its range or considered to be secure. You can see it's very widespread across the Eastern US here, but it's rare in Idaho. It's, one, it's the rarest category in Idaho, imperiled or it's, yes, highly imperiled. I, I forget the exact wording, but something like that. Another type, there are three types of lady slippers. The second one, Cypripedium fasciculatum, is clustered lady slippers. These have much smaller um, green or maroon, green and maroon slippers. 
you can see just about thumb size there, a thumb per scale. This one's pollinated by female Cinetus wasps that are looking for fungal gnat larvae to lay their eggs. So they lay their eggs in the larvae of these fungal gnats. And in the process, they go into these, these uh, little slippers looking for fungal gnats and they'll pick up the pollinia in the process. And so it's hypothesized that the, the um, orchid must be putting out an odor that smells like either fungal gnats or the type of fungi that these larvae in, in, inhabit. The clustered lady slipper is um, blooms in the summer. It's it is also rare in the state. You can see North Idaho there. And then the third type of lady slipper we have is the mountain lady slipper, Cypripedium montanum, which has large white slippers. Really a striking plant. You can see here where it's found across the state, across the Northwest. A different genus, we have only one member of Epipactus in Idaho, Epipactus gigantea. It is the biggest orchid in the state. If you see an orchid that's a meter tall, this is, this is there's nothing you can confuse it with. This giant stream orchid is what you must be looking at. It's often found around hot springs where I've only seen it a couple times, but it, each time it was at the outflow of a hot springs. It's found across the state, across the western part of the state. It's S3, which is kind of middle of the, you know, it's the lowest of the three categories that are considered rare. S1, S2, and S3 are considered rare. So it is on our rare plant list. Now this one I like because you can see it year round. It's, you can see the leaves anyway, year round. And they're very distinctive net veined leaves. Um, in general, orchids have parallel veined leaves. It's just that the markings on these leaves are net veined or are, are netted, you can see. And, and there's really nothing else I can think of in our flora that you'll confuse that with. So when I see them, it's like, oh, even if I only see the leaves, I know I'm looking at an orchid. And it's fairly common in the, in the deep woods, Western rattlesnake plantain. Here are the and flowers. a question about the evolution of orchids. Did mm -hmm. they first evolve in South America? And is that where the most species are found? Ah. Uh. In, in general, as, this, as the person asking the question is describing, wherever the greatest species diversity is, is often the source of where they originated. And when I think about orchids around the world, it seems like there would be, it seems like that would be a logical source of origin, but I don't actually know where they came from. It's a great question. Maybe Abigail could look that one up. <laughs> be origin of diversity for, for orchids. <laughs> the Western uh, rattlesnake plantain blooms in the spring, late spring through summer, but as I said, you can see the leaves all year long, as long as they aren't under the snow. This is one that I really love. It, it glows kind of a ghostly white and it's found in the forest understory. So there's not much light in that area, but the plant almost seems to glow with its own light. This is the snow orchid or phantom orchid. As you might guess, since it's all white, including the stems, it doesn't have any chlorophyll or leaves. And it's pollinated by a, a type of sweat bee. Let's see. It's found um, only in a few counties in the state. It is on the rare plant list, but it's, it's a bit more common. I think at some point we might need to re reassess this one. I know Karen Gray said she found a lot of it in her uh, research. There are others that also don't have um, any chlorophyll in their leaves or no, they have no leaves, basically no chlorophyll in the plant. They're the coral root orchids, and there are five species in the state. You can see three of them here. Uh, the one on the right has a little bit of chlorophyll, and we'll go into each of these. 
they actually have almost no root. They have these short coral-like rhizomes. So that's why they're called coral root orchids. You can see here in this collection by Jim Smith, um, there's really not much. It's almost amazing the plant can stay in the ground. Not much to the, the roots. There are these little blobs on the, on the bottom left part of the sheet, of the herbarium sheet there. Well, if they don't have any chlorophyll, how do they get their energy? Anybody, somebody want to unmute and answer? <laughs> or put it, or type it in the chat if you're shy. <laughs> Are they saprophytic? Yes, that saprophytic or perhaps parasitic. Um, there could be, it could be a mix of both. They uh, definitely parasitize fungi. So there, there are demonstrated cases where they are parasites, but there could be some saprophytes out there too. A parasite means it gains nutrients from a host or another organism at the host's expense. So a saprophyte would be eating something that was already dead, um, say, say fungi decaying a dead tree stump or something. So in this case, they are parasitic. They're getting their um, carbon and nutrients from the fungi and they have to have the fungi to live. And for a long time, the, the research on this is actually quite recent, um, demonstrating that, that the fungi get nothing in return from the orchids. So in, in these particular studies, they found that the orchids they were looking at were parasitic on the fungi. You think about it, where the, where the fungi are getting their food or energy, this is where the saprophyte part comes in. Um, they can get it from dead or decaying matter. So an orchid may be parasitizing a saprophytic fungi, or they may be getting it directly from the roots of green plants, so, or from um, root exudates in which they're not tapping the green plant, or they may be getting it from the green plant itself, in which case the fungi are parasitizing the plants. So it's, it's kind of a complicated, uh, cascade there. Well, as I mentioned, there are five species of coral roots, striped coral root or coralized striata. These have maroon stems that are striped, uh, maroon stems and striped tepals. And this is the only one of our five coral roots that has striped tepals. So if you see that, you know you're looking at coralized striata. Here you can see where they're found across the state. In case they're in your neighborhood. It looks like they're not in the Wood River Valley though. The Pacific coral root is another favorite of mine. They also kind of glow in the forest understory with their own light. They're, they look uh, purple more than, well, some are maroonish. The ones I've seen have been more purple. They do not have striped tepals, as you can see. Here's some purple ones. And then there's the spring coral root, which has these spots on a spoon-shaped labellum. So if you see a, a tan coral root or a, a, a coral root that doesn't have any chlorophyll and it has spots on a spoon-shaped labellum, you know you're looking at the spring coral root. There. That's a giveaway. Most of these, well, everything we're going through first are quite distinctive. And then I put the ones that all look alike, we'll cover those at the end. So if you can get these in your, in your mind, get a picture in your mind. These are limited to just far Eastern Idaho. And so I think they should be assessed for the rare plant list. I don't know if Rose Lehman's on here today, but I, I believe she's planning to assess this one. So here's the summer coral root or the spotted coral root, Coralariza maculata. Um, it's also tan because it doesn't have chlorophyll, but it has purple spots, but you'll notice its labellum is shaped differently. See, it's not shaped like a spoon, like the spring coral root. Instead, it's got a little, you might think of a fringe on the edge and it turns down, downward. It's not at all cupped up like a spoon. So those are traits you could look for to tell those two species apart. Then we have a question about the color of the orchid. Does that depend on the nutrients that they get from the fungi? Ah, that's a good question. There, um, it doesn't actually. 
the, I don't know if you meant the, if the questioner meant the color of the flower or the color of the stem, but the colors of flowers in general, I've wondered that myself, did they come from nutrients or something in the soil? But it's actually not, it's, it's actually um, a genetic component and has to do with the, the actual pigments in the flower. So it's not, it doesn't have to do with the nutrients they've absorbed. Yeah, that's a good question. Of course, the ones that have tan stems, they're tan because they lack chlorophyll. So here you can see that spotted coral root is found widely across the state. So hopefully you can have a chance to see that in your, your area. The yellow coral root has a little bit of chlorophyll. It's not dark green, but a little bit to um, give it give a little bit of color, but it still parasitizes the fungi. And there you can see its distribution north of you all in the Wood River. Now we're gonna go, that's all the distinctive orchids. Now we're gonna go through some groups of what I call the ones that all look alike. They're um, several members of each of these genera and they have similar looking flowers. I'm gonna try and point out some differences, uh, but for some of these, you just have to key them, uh, especially when we get into the third group here, the bog orchids or rain orchids, Platanthera. They're, they're quite a, there are nine species in the state and they really look very similar. So but we'll go through them, go through these three genera and you can hopefully pick up a few traits to at least ID them to gen genus. First, we're gonna cover the tway blades which is Neotia, or it used to be Listeria, Listeria. Uh, four species of those, and they all have two opposite leaves. That's where tway blade comes from. Tway is slang for two, two opposite leaves. They don't have any spurs on the flowers. I'll show you some that do have spurs. Well, the, the bog orchids do have spurs. And then they have green flowers. So we'll go through those. There's a classic tway blade. You can see the two opposite leaves here, two, like a pair on opposite sides of the stem. The flowers lack a spur. There's, if this was turned around, there's nothing on the back of it. And then this is a, another green, green flower that's typical of this group. You can see it's in the central and northern part of the state. If you're paying attention at all to the bloom dates, you'll notice a lot of them are piling up in the kind of June to August window. It's a good time to be looking for any of these orchids in the woods. There's the heart leaf, heart leaf tway blade. Its individual leaves are heart shaped and its flower is shaped like a little person, a little stick figure. I'm not really sure what it's trying to uh, attract there in terms of pollinators. Similar range and bloom a little bit earlier than the other one, but similar time. Northern tway blades, Neotia borealis. This uh, has an unusual shaped labellum. It's green and it has a pair of leaves like the other two, but you can see a groove down the middle of the labellum. And it produces so much nectar, the nectar actually drips out of this little channel so an insect will land here, lick the nectar up, and then it encounters the column where it picks up pollinia. Kind of an ingenious little mechanism of luring pollinators in. It's not nearly as common as those other species, the other uh, Neotias. And so I think we need to assess this one for the rare plant list as well. And the broad-lipped tway blade, as you might guess by looking at this labellum with the groove down the middle, it has the same strategy of putting out a lot of nectar. And you can actually see, if I can get, you can actually see the little groove there and the column at the at the top of the groove. Now the Second genera that, that has a group that all look alike. These have white flowers, not green like the tway blades. Um, 
they have short spikes of flowers about, well, it varies uh, three to say three to six inches tall spikes covered with flowers. These are the ladies tresses or Spiranthes genus. Their flowers also lack spurs. The Ute ladies tresses that John Shelley was um, searching for, um, they're a threatened species found over on the South Fork of the Snake. And you can look at these flowers. If you look closely, you'll see there's no spur on the back of them. They're white flowers, like the other members of that genus. And they are basically flat and arranged in a more in a pretty loose um, spike here, or spike-like raceme, depending what you want to call it. And that'll be in contrast to another type of ladies' tresses I'll show you in a minute, where they're much more compact on the spike. The flowers are much more compact. They're only known from the South Fork of the Snake and the lower part of the Henry's Fork near the confluence in Idaho. That's, that's the only place they're known. It is our only orchid that's on the uh, threatened and endangered list. So quite rare. Here's the hooded ladies' tresses for comparison. And any of you who are on that field trip we took to Mays Creek Fen a couple years ago, Native Plant Society uh, took there. We had uh, just a great time and we got to see this hooded ladies' tresses there. You can see it similar to the other, to the Ute ladies' tresses and that it has these white flowers arranged in a spike, but they're much closer together. And the overall shape of the top of the flower is more like a hood as opposed to going straight up. You can really see the hood on that particular flower there. Unfortunately, for those of us looking for Ute ladies' tresses, this one grows in the same place. The hooded ladies' tresses grows St. Patrickly, so uh, we really have to look closely sometimes. Lynn, we have a question about Sporanthes. Um, okay. Does it show up one year and not the next? It can, yes. It can be dormant underground, which can make it tough <laughs> if you're looking for it. So if the conditions aren't right, I, I don't know that those conditions are necessarily known, but I would guess it's something like if there's not enough moisture in it at, a, at the right time of year that it wouldn't come up, it wouldn't uh, end up blooming. It might show up just in the just in the leaves, it might just show up vegetatively, or it might stay dormant underground. That's a good question. Then there's a Spiranthes that's only known from one site in the whole state. And this is Creamy Ladies Tresses. It also has a spike of white flowers, as I mentioned, but there are subtle differences in the shape of the flower and the labellum that would help to differentiate it. This was discovered by Sandra Robbins. Um, uh, I'm sure many of you in the, in the White Pine chapter know Sandra. And Sam Fuchs is shown in this picture on the left. He's doing a study of it for us. Janet, he and Janice Hill have done uh, quite a bit of work on this plant, documenting it through the, through the years and uh, other species in the Craig Mountain area. So it's only in Idaho, it's only known from Craig Mountain. This is the one little, one little area, one site, no less than 60 plants. So it's quite rare here. Well, that brings us to the last group, the last nine species. And they're all members of the Platanthera, which are the rain orchids, bog orchids, and green orchids, as they're currently classified. These have a long spike, and they do have spurs on the flowers, which I'll show you in a minute. And they, some have green flowers, some have white flowers. The first of those, I'm going to go through them rather quickly because they do look all alike and we've only got about 20 minutes left. But um, their uh, round leaf orchid has these big round leaves. It's pretty distinctive. And here you can see a spur hanging down off the back of a flower. So when you're trying to ID orchids, you've got to look and see if it has a spur on it. If it's got a long spike of white or green flowers and it does have a spur, then you're in the Platanthera. 
this. Um, there's, this one's only known from three counties in the state and we almost certainly need to get it on our rare plant list. I'm not sure why it's classified as S3, but for some reason it's not on the list. So that one needs assessment. A couple of these we, yeah, we're in the process of assessing. So blunt leaved orchid has one blunt shaped leaf. Some of these are really appropriately named, huh? And it's pollinated by moths and mosquitoes. Let's see. Okay. From only two counties in the state. The dense flowered rain orchid has the flowers grouped much more closely together on this on the um, flowering stalk on the inflorescence. And it has green flowers. I know you're I'm going kind of quickly, but you're just these you're just gonna have to key if you find them. <laughs> or be happy with Platanthra. Now this one is more distinctive. It of the um Platan of all the Platanthra species, this one has white flowers and it and it I can recognize this one by sight. I see it often enough. Um and there aren't others that have these kind of stark white flowers. So it's called scent bottle. That's one name for it because it smells like cloves. And owlet moths or skippers, skipper butterflies um, pollinate this one. And it's fairly common. We'll see that you can see it's found all over the state. We also saw this one on our trip, on our field trip with the Native Plant Society to Mace Creek Fen a couple of years ago. Well, I was wrong when I said it was the only white flowered one. I've already forgotten. The elegant rain orchid is also white, <clears throat> but the flowers are kind of distinctly different shape wise. It's also pollinated by moths. Kind of seeing a theme here, huh? <laughs> the Huron green orchid is one of several green ones. So I'll just tell you that when you're trying to ID them, <clears throat> you have to look at the, the shape of the, of, the, of the flower parts because that's what, that's what varies and differentiates them. I mean, that's typical for keying plants in general, but when you're trying to kind of get things by overall gestalt or site, you're gonna have to look at the shape of those flower parts. Slender bog orchid has uh, similar shaped flowers also and, and leaves. So you're probably gonna be pulling the key out for this one. <laughs> Likewise, the Northern green orchid, similar shaped flowers these, and uh, long narrow leaves. Alaska rain orchid is more distinctive. To me, to my eye, its flowers look kind of frilly. So if you found a green one with, you know, a tall green spike like that, and um, the, the, um, some of the, with the recurved petals, you might be looking at Alaska rain orchid. Some of these, including this one, were used by Native Americans. Uh, they would actually eat the starchy root. Of course, nowadays, these things are too uncommon and too many people out there looking at orchids. So I wouldn't recommend you digging, up and, digging them up and eating them. In fact, on the national forest, it's probably illegal to do so. Many of these orchids are protected and just not common enough. Even if you aren't eating them, if you're just gonna try and transplant them at home, they don't transplant very well because of those fungal associations that are so important. Then there are three that might be in, or in Idaho, but aren't documented. The frog orchid is known from Washington and Montana. So it might be her in between. Round leaf orchid is known from adjacent Montana and very well could be in the Northern two counties of Idaho. And then lesser rattlesnake plantain. And Rich Merkel um, recently reported this from North Idaho. I, I don't know that I've seen a documentation yet. But 
Sounds like it's here, new discovery. Then there's one invasive species that could reach us. This is broadleaf helleborine or Epipactus helleborine. It's um, native to Eurasia and it's a greenhouse weed. As you can see, it's very invasive in the Northeastern or widespread invasive in the Northeastern US. So knocking on our door there in Montana, from Montana there. It is pretty at least. <laughs> Have you got a question, John, about that one? Oh, you're muted. The I can't other, see most people's hands. The other oh. epipactus uh, that you mentioned, Gigantia, you can drive to that on the Fairfield Ranger District. Uh, it, it grows at uh, Baumgartner Hot Springs. Oh, great. Right, right in the okay. campground. Or if you want to take a, a two mile hike up Big Smoky Creek, you could uh, view it at Skillern Hot Springs. Excellent. And okay, I've so there are two places. Uh -huh. And then I've talked to other people uh, along the Snake River uh, south of Wendell. I haven't seen it, but I talked to people that have. So there's three places that you could more or less get pretty close to it in a vehicle, especially at Baumgartner. You can, you can get within a 50 yards of it within a parking within the parking lot of Baumgartner Hot Springs. Great. I'd look forward to the outflow of the hot springs there, Ben. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh-huh. Hey, Lynn, while we're um, talking about um, this particular one, someone's uh -huh. asking, what is the drawback of this particular invasive orchid? That's, oh, so it's, it's a, um, invasive species in general, when they, when they invade or come in, the, there's several problems they can cause. Ecologically, they can fill niches that were previously empty or previously occupied by native species. And so those native species can no longer grow there. Cheatgrass would be an example. And I don't know how this one grows. I don't have any experience with it since really, since I haven't seen it, but um, sometimes they can grow in thick swaths or swords that don't allow the native species to thrive. So they can displace the natives. Sometimes they may carry genes that can mix with the natives and dilute those species. Um, sometimes they uh, may carry a disease, introduce a disease such as Chinese chestnut that, that got into the American chestnut. Um, there's just a whole slew of ecological problems that they cause, especially when they become very dense and displace native plants. Well, we've only got about 10 minutes left. I better get going here. The orchid lookalikes that you may see in the wild are um, several that, that lack chlorophyll, shown here, broom rape, candy stick, and pine drops. Which orchids, which Idaho orchids do those remind you of? Somebody unmute and shout it out. <laughs> Coral root. Yes. Excellent, the coral root orchids, and they're tan. So to refresh your memory, you know, if you see a tall spike of tan uh, flowers there, it may be an orchid, but it might also be pine drops or a couple of those others. So familiarize yourself with some of those lookalikes. Here are some of the other coral roots. Just to refresh your memory. And then a couple that I've, I've, I've confused from a distance are the coiled louseworts, the particularis, and several of the catchflies or silenes. They have a tall spike of white flowers. So what does that remind you of? Which Idaho orchids does that remind you of? Pyranthes? Yes, excellent. Thanks, Derek. <laughs> The spiranthes are ladies' tresses, and some of the bog orchids or rain orchids, the platanthera as well. So you do have to keep your eye out that if you see a white spike of flowers, it could be an orchid, but it could be one of these others too. When you're searching for orchids, it really helps to know, have a search image in your head ahead of time. So look them up in your field guides, or if you have an app, look them up in an app beforehand and learn them and preferably their lookalikes. 
get an overall feel of what the plants look like. Then if you're gonna aim for peak flowering time as we did on our field trip, um, basically mid-June to mid-August for most of the species in Idaho. This was our field trip group there. Um, you can check likely habitats such as creeks and seeps. I found two orchids in this area. It was uh, down here along the creek and this kind of a bog settling area here, which is probably really either a fen or just a kind of marshy area, but river floodplains, deep woods, ditches, ditch banks, good one. When you're out looking, take your camera with you and have a ruler for scale. In this case, the person had a puppy for a scale, but you might not have a puppy handy. So you could put your ruler there and then post your photo on iNaturalist or something or show it to friends for help with ID. And then lastly, be sure to leave wild orchids where you find them. They're not common enough and they don't transplant well. Now I'm just gonna show about five pictures of historic orchid hunting and a couple of our research and then I'm just gonna open it to general questions. The orchid era, orchid delirium era began in 1818 with orchids that were shipped to England from Brazil. And John Swainson, William John Swainson, um, the famous ornithologist was instrumental in getting this going. He has several birds such as Swainson's thrush that, and Swainson's hawk that are named in his honor. Orchid fever, orchid delirium took off at that time and it was uh, fueled by this or, these orchid hunters in the tropics. And you can see here all these men receiving, this is a shipment of orchids. You can see Rangoon on the side of the box here. Um, it was Burma, but now Min Myanmar. And they would receive these boxes of orchids of which often many died in shipment, um, but enough lived to make it profitable. And people would pay hundreds of dollars for these rare orchids. It was in general a man's profession. Women were considered too delicate to gaze upon the uh, suggestive or sensual flowers of an orchid and they would swoon and things like that. And, you know, they did a lot of that in those days. So um, it's primarily a man's occupation. Here you can see the um, burrows low. This is a photo from Columbia, 1923, burrows loaded with orchids to be shipped out of the country. This was really dangerous work because tropical diseases and um, you know, just all kinds of hazards in the trop, working in the tropics, especially when people were from all over the world going to these areas. Some were stripped completely of orchids, like locally depleted. And I mentioned that many died, but by the early 1900s, cultivation methods had improved enough to um, re greatly reduce the need for orchid hunting, so to speak. So they began to be cultivated and, and increased in, at home in their areas. And then I'll, I'll just show a couple here of our modern day orchid hunting. This is uh, led by Jennifer Miller. You can see on the right here on the South Fork of the Snake that John mentioned earlier where Ute Lady's Tresses occurs. She's been our leader for more than 10 years and we've done all kinds of surveys with the BLM there. Monica Zimmerman on the right from BLM has led us to some great orchid sites and helped us find, navigate the river. And we had funding from BLM as well as Forest Service Fish and Wildlife and those of you who donate to the Non-Game Wildlife Conservation Fund. So thank you if you have a license plate. One of the primary things we've done is censuses on the South Fork of the Snake for you ladies' tresses. Just a few pictures from that time. It's really a great place to work. <laughs> Tough assignment, huh? <laughs> it's not all, all fun and games. Some of it's <laughs> difficult. <laughs> and here we were walking around mapping the plants. Um, you can see the yellow would be our lines and the pink would be the plants. We found about 4,000 plants on in one given study and four new locations. I should say Jennifer did. I was just along to help. So. Well, I'm going to stop there, and um, this is this is that area. I'm going to stop there and blast on through these um, and talk about the Native Plant Society or just briefly mention Native Plant Society field trips where you can potentially see orchids work with Idaho Master Naturalists. They have helped us in our work. And then you can even volunteer with Fish and Game for things like planting shrubs 
and planting willows in moist areas, you may end up seeing orchids. Then the Treasure Valley Orchid Show is a wonderful show of domestic orchids held every April. And they're a great group if you can get involved with them. So with that, I'll wish you happy orchid hunting and take a few questions if you'd like. Any, any questions or is Kristen getting some in the, Lynn, Kristen, are you getting any? Lynn, I have a question. Okay, I've, Mary. I've always been fascinated with, uh, um, you know, the speciation of orchids and how it became such a diverse plant family. Um, and I'm st still as curious as I've ever been. Any, in, any, anything I can hang my hat on to I think it comes to the close ties with pollinators. Some of these orchids, a given orchid species will be uh, pollinated by only one species of pollinator. And so when, you know, when, when it's that specialized, it just leads to uh, great diversity. I mean, pollinator, insect pollinators themselves are very diverse. There are many insects in the world. And so I think there's some kind of a link there. Anybody else? I have a question. Uh, this is Nancy Miller. Um, it says Reed Miller, but that's my husband. And that's his. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the frog orchid and the round leaf orchid in the very, that would probably be found in the very north part. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of habitats are they in? The frog orchid is uh, along the river. So I would look at, look for it along the upper priest river or uh, although maybe more sunny than that, um, there, there's a river that flows from like Medellin Falls. I think that that species is known there. And oh, I might I might be confusing it with something else. But that's a rep more riparian one or what wet meadow one. And then yeah, I'm I'm confusing it with uh, Pinguicula, uh, uh, carnivorous I plant. That, I noticed but the that other that one. Okay. Yeah, I noticed the that other is uh, from forest understory. Okay. I, I noticed that Harpo Faust was on um, the list. I don't know whether she's still on or not, but she just did uh, that survey up in the very north part. And I was wondering if she had seen anything that might give a clue about frog orchids or round leaf orchids. Since the area she was in was between Montana and Washington and up in there. Right. I don't know. She's I haven't there. heard her mention that. I bet if she, I kind of think if she had, she would have let me know because she's found <laughs> some state records and she's let us know about it. She's let Derek and me and a few others, Ben, know about it. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, I have a question. Okay. Uh, about eight years ago, my wife and I were showing Tom Nelson around Craig Mountain. Uh, you showed one of Tom Nelson's, he, he's out of New York, one of mm -hmm. his orchid pictures. Uh, I think he's even been author of a couple of books on orchids. orchids. He's quite a good photographer. Anyway, uh, we were looking for the rare spiranthes. Uh, Karen Gray gave me a few tips. Uh, since it's so rare, I won't say exactly where it is, but uh, a forest fire had gone through there maybe a year or two before we were there, and we spent the better part of a day looking for it. I'm sure we were in the spot that Karen said she'd seen it. Uh, and do you know if anyone has found it there since then? Which, which species was it? Well, I'm trying to, I can't remember the species name. It's the rare one that's on Craig Mountain. Oh, okay, that'd uh, be Spiranthes porifolia. Yeah, uh -huh. okay, yeah, poor To my knowledge, it has not been found anywhere in the state outside of that. But that's well, great, you were looking for it. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware that it's, it's in a very small area. I, I'm a little worried that it might be gone because there have actually been a few lighter fires through that area. Uh, we spend quite a bit of time on Wapshilla Ridge because it has a, 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 a real huge diversity of wildflowers, especially Calicordus, which I like. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I don't know. I'll try to get in touch with some people that are also down there and 
and find out if, if it's gone or maybe it is recovered, I hope. Janice Hill has seen it more recently than its initial discovery, mm -hmm. but I, can't, I couldn't tell you whether it was four or five years ago. Yeah. So yeah. it was still extant then. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Lynn, a couple of comments. Um, ben Legler says that Harpo did not find it. Thanks for checking, Ben. Yeah. Ben works with Harpo at the herbarium there at UI. Great. And then a couple people are late. Well, several people have left um, a little early. Several people have said thanks so much. Um, and then we do have a question. Will long-term drought endanger orchids? It very well could. Um, the drought is one of the big factors that imperils this, causes some of these species to be imperiled. Climate change in general, you know, as you can imagine, orchids are very closely tied with their fungi and big shifts in climate or, or dry periods are tough for them to navigate, so to speak. Do they have the ability to sort of go dormant? I mean, if there's a, a drought period, say, where they can go dormant, maybe get a little bit of vegetative um, action. Uh, and then when the water table rises or there's a greater rainfall, then you see a lot of them? Yes, mm -hmm. that occurs. And even, um, you know, for a, for a period of few years, but if there's a shift and the climate changes for you know, 20 or 30 years or permanently, then that they're not going to be able to navigate and move. Mm -hmm. So not presumably they're off, hopefully their offspring could settle in more northern areas or higher elevation areas that had more moisture. And so that might allow them to perpetuate. Mm -hmm. Here's a kind of a similar question. How do fires affect orchids? They can help orchids um, as long as if, if the fire clears away vegetation and it's an orchid that's say a sun loving species like you ladies tresses, a fire could potentially help. It would get, a, get rid of some of that dense over, under, uh, over dense shading material, plant material. Um, but if the fire goes through and then cheatgrass invasion follows or something like that, then that could harm it. So it would be really mixed depending on the type of change. Well, maybe we can take one or two more questions if anybody has any. I know we're running over time a little bit, but it's such a fascinating subject and, um, and Lynn's a wonderful expert on it. So. Lynn, John here. John, Hi, shall John. I begin? Uh, I was just curious whether there's, there's been any, any uh, study type information uh, dealing with livestock grazing impact on orchids. It, it varies widely. What, what we see, I mean, it would vary by species. Trampling, they're really susceptible to trampling. So if the, that flower stalk gets broken off, that's it for the year for that species. And if the livestock grazing is heavy enough that it leads to invasion by non-native species, that can be detrimental. But for some, this is kind of a similar pattern as fire. It, like you ladies tresses, light grazing that removes some of that understory for a, for a sun loving species of orchid can actually be helpful. So it really depends on the level and um, what happens there. Let's and I think see. Mary might have had a question. Yeah, Lynn, thanks. Thank you. What, what were the group of orchids that had that little tiny rhizal, uh, rhiza? Coral and, roots, the coral root orchids. And then how is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, please. Only through fungi. You know, they, that's, I guess I didn't emphasize that very much. Those, they have to have a connection with fungi to absorb their nutrients. And the core, the rhizomes anchor the plant a little bit, but they're not functional enough for the orchid to survive on its own. Good question. Christian? Yes, okay. Lou, hello, how are you? What type of white orchid do we have at Scout Mountain? I'm. I thought it was just a bog orchid, but it is. There's that there. Kristen sent me. Is that the one you sent me the picture of, Kristen? No, that was uh, Mill Creek. Oh, okay. Uh, in those uh, uh, the north end of uh, the Wood River Valley. Okay. 
Well, did we see a picture of it that you were going through? I showed every orchid in the state. So whatever you saw on Scout Mountain, we did see. And I, I imagine it was one of those bog orchids. Um, it could very well be the scent bottle because it's a more common one. And I think so, when we were up there, Mary and John, correct me, didn't we see um, coral roots? Yes, we've got coral roots too. Yeah, great. Right. Right. Yeah, we did. It, we, we did see coral, coral roots. And I wouldn't expect the ladies' tresses up there. So I doubt if you saw a spike of white flowers, I wouldn't think it was any of the spiranthes or ladies' tresses. So that pretty much just leaves the bog orchids that has a white spike. Yeah, our our bog orchid grows in really marshy area. That's great, you saw it. How neat. <laughs> so any other last questions um, that something that you're that's preying on your mind or something you saw or you're curious about? Well, Lynn, thank you so much. And uh, thanks to the 81 people who joined us tonight. That was pretty wonderful. Um, and uh, in the chat, so many people are saying thank you and great photos and lovely nice. talk. And um, so uh, thanks to everybody. Um, thanks to our Wood River Board for helping out with this. And, and Lynn, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Kristen. And thanks to all of you. Appreciate your input too. Take care. <laughs> All right. Good night. Good night.